This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, a conversation with John Nielsen. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek. And I'm Gwen, and we're two people with PhDs talking about comics. And on this episode, Gwen and I have the pleasure of talking with John Nielsen. His new book, Look, debuts at MochaFest this year, which takes place this weekend as we're recording this. But before we get to that conversation, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews is brought to you by the wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts can be 20 to 35% off of the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some incredible specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off the cover price. Sometimes 50% off cover. But many times you can find discounts that are even more impressive than that. This is true, and although John Nielsen's look is not yet available on DCBS, they do have a number of other comics from Nielsen's publisher, NBM Publishing, and um, this month you can get Sadrine Ravel's graphic novel biography, Glenn Gould, A Life Off Tempo, which is going to be released in April, and that sounds really interesting, especially for those of our listeners who are um, interested in music, and Mm -hmm. uh, they also have a really fascinating um, graphic novel called Marie Antoinette Phantom Queen by Annie and Rudolf Goetzinger and I just pre-ordered it because it is about an artist who visit who is visited by Marie Antoinette's ghost and she I guess she confides many of her secrets in this artist so since I have a real interest in French history I thought well I probably need to look at this yeah. Um, what's yeah what's not to like about that and exactly Fulton- head lop and goodness <laughs> That's right. Um, Both comics are offered at 30% off list price. And of course, DCBS has many more comics with these wonderful deep discounts. That's right. You can't go wrong by checking out Discount Comic Book Service. Their website is dcbservice.com. Go there for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get those titles there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that Gwen and Derek sent you. Well, Gwen, this was a really nice interview with John. Uh, We had a good time talking with him about Look, but it was also interesting in that we learned during the interview that this was his very first time not only in New York, and he's there for MochaFest this year, but uh, uh, on the East Coast. Yeah, it was all I could do not to give him restaurant recommendations, but I figure that uh, the good folks at Mocha will be finding him lots of fun stuff to eat and uh, places to go. So it's, But it is exciting for him, and it's great that this weekend he has the, the debut of, of Look. That's right, and it is coming out from NBM. And you know, just to, to give our listeners a, a, a rundown of what to expect in the book, a, a Look is, I would call it an all age narrative and it takes place on a world where apparently uh, there are no more humans but what we see at least at the very beginning are robots and even some animals now as the story develops we start to question whether these animals are actually the animals and I'll leave it at that Um, but our main robot who goes by the name of Artie uh, his name is I guess actually really the letter R and then dash and then T-Y, but it sounds like Artie, and that's how he's referred to. But we see Artie at the beginning, and he is accompanied by a friend of his who is a vulture named Owen. And Owen is asking Artie if he's going to continue wandering in the desert like he always does. And Artie, who apparently is a robot whose job is to just observe, thus the title look, goes back and forth across the desert on a regular basis just as he's programmed. 
But at the beginning of the book, he decides to do something different, and the reason why he wants to shift from his routine is he wants to discover why he's doing what he's doing, and it's this decision to go off of the beaten path, so to speak, that sets things off. It really does initiate the adventure, and so we see him and his friend Owen encounter a variety of other individuals in different situations, many other robots, and it leads them to – I don't know if I would call it uh, self-discovery. They discover something, but the book is rather open-ended in a very nice way. And so I think that this is this is a great book. You and I have uh, described it, Gwen, when we've talked off mic as somewhat existential in nature. Yes, and there are there's a nice balance between these sort of contemplative philosophical moments in the text, and then once the action adventure starts, it's pretty fast paced. So it's a comic that has a sort of variety of pacing, and I, I think we were joking. It was like um, looking for Godot in the desert could be a <laughs> or waiting for Godot in the desert <laughs> or waiting yeah. Godot <laughs> or looking for him. Um, but uh, yeah, it was it was really sweet. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and share that interview with John. Well, we are really pleased today to be talking with John Nielsen, who is about to see his comic um, called Look premiere at MOCA and be published by NBM Press. And we're so excited for him. And John, we sort of wanted to get the ball rolling by asking you if you could give our listeners sort of the elevator pitch for your new graphic novel. Oh, sure. Totally. The uh, pitch that I always used was that it is about a little robot who is unhappy with his lot in life. Well, that's a quick elevator ride. <laughs> yeah. It's like we went up to just the first floor. <laughs> I think actually that was the mezzanine, but uh, <laughs> that is true. And um, having just had the pleasure of reading it, um, our little robot um, doesn't really have a lot of human companionship. Maybe you could talk a bit about the world that you've created for him to be in. Yeah, sort of the idea of this is that all these robots are left in this on this world, and it could be Earth, it could not necessarily be Earth, but the point is that humans aren't around anymore. They used to be, and they're not. Now either they left or something happened to them. There's just robots now, mm-hmm. and all the robots that are left behind, they just keep continuing to perform whatever their function was. So Artie, the main character robot, is his job is just go in circles around this desert. He's some sort of surveillance droid, and he just does it forever. That that actually gets me to think about the title, um, which is "Look." Um, it's a great one word. It, it certainly, in fact, when Derek sent me um, a copy of the front cover of your book, I was like, "Yes, I want to interview this guy." <laughs> it's a great <laughs> cover, and yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the title, why you chose it? Um, for Yeah, for some felicity. And I think it it has a couple different meanings. You know, um, that's his job is to look. But then he's also looking for deeper meaning in that. Mm-hmm. And then not to give it away, but, but when he finally discovers the deeper meaning, he, he's not exactly happy with it. And he needs to go <laughs> even deeper. He's, it's continuing – Loop of looking, I suppose. <laughs> that's a really good way to put it. Yeah. And in fact, one of the <laughs> one of the one of the things that's really noticeable about this book is that you know, given the kind of story that you're telling and the art, which you know, it, it, it's definitely something that a younger reader would would really gravitate toward. Um, I mean, there, there's quite a bit of depth here. Uh, I couldn't help but think of. Let's say Waiting for Godot or other works by Samuel Beckett. Uh, I, I guess in general, I found this a rather existential narrative. I, I would, yeah, I would describe it as my midlife crisis book. <laughs> <laughs> That's really what it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, that's great. 
<laughs> I'm not even 30 yet, but I think it, I, I, there's some stuff that you know I was kind of going through. Wow, are you having comics. a midlife crisis at that age? Yeah, a little early, yeah. You are precocious. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I was trying because comics is kind of what I've gotten into is what I've been, I like to do. and But I was having a hard – like, am I really good at this? Is this what I need to keep doing? All that sort of – you know. Mm. And I end up putting that – do a book about robots. Well, maybe this is a really good time to segue into talking about your work as a comics writer um, on a webcomic that I just got a chance to read some of today. Um, and I hope I'm saying this correctly. Massive Pawnage. Is that correct? Uh, uh, pawnage. It's pawnage. sort of like okay. a, a weird variation of the word ownage. It's a silly gaming thing <laughs> no, but <laughs> that it's people real. don't say anymore. It's like an outdated word by this point. Well, I both missed when it was in and apparently when it left. So, but um, I see that you did this for a number of years um, with mm-hmm. Josh Rivas as the writer and you as the artist. So, right, were there things yeah. that were there things that you picked up there that you then sort of found found their way into into look? Yeah, that's definitely like where like I got my start in comics. And where I discovered that that's something that I enjoyed doing. And after doing it for I, – I did Bounce of Pony for I think three or four years before mm-hmm. I finally – I got the itch to tell a long-form story. And that's where it came from. And in fact, in in going through Massive Punnage, I was noticing the evolution, not only of the storytelling, uh, of of how it went from, let's say, a gag strip, right, kind of a done in one, right, daily, right. somewhat daily kind of kind of strip, to to something where there is more uh, story depth. But I also noticed that the art evolved quite a bit, uh, and and I think it's in that second year that things started to take form to a, a, a kind of style that I definitely recognize in look. Oh, well, thank you for saying so. <laughs> so if you, if that you, old I, art is – oh, sorry. I was no, going to say that old art is hard to look at for me. Well, you know, tell us a bit about the, <laughs> the evolution of that style uh, and not only how you feel that you have developed as an artist but also as a storyteller. Oh, well, uh, stubbornness mostly, uh, just keep banging my head against it until it gets to looking the way I like it to look and it's still not there yet, but it's a process. And what? <laughs> sorry, no, go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask you what, um, artists really influenced you when you were coming up. Um, oh, um. Let's see. What cartoons were on TV back then? Oh, Batman the Animated Series. So which animation was more. So of an yeah, cartoons. Yeah, mm-hmm. TV. I yeah, fun, I didn't read comics growing up, which is weird. That that is what I ended up latching onto, but I, I didn't really read. I didn't read Batman or Superman, Superman or or anything. Barely, I barely even read Peanuts. In the, com- in the newspaper, I didn't read Calvin and Hobbes until like a few years ago. Well, what brought you to web comics them. then? Um, I just started finding them all over on the internet. There was like a boom of web comics around 2006 or 2007, mm. and they were uh, like gaming related and things that I like cared about. And like I got the jokes, and like all these jokes are for me and my <laughs> friends. They're about us. Yeah, and, <laughs> and we should we should mention to our listeners, and we will put a link up in our show notes to this interview that if they want to check out your various web comics, um, they can go to darkmagicpress.com, dot com, mm-hmm. and that's one word, Dark Magic Press, and there they can see right. a variety of short stories, massive pawnage, uh, some of your a link to some of your animations, uh, a work that you did, uh, uh, I guess the art for Magic Universe with uh, that what Josh Revis. Uh, did, right, yeah, did, it was Josh. Yeah, it did the uh, writing for. And also, 
uh, an early version of Look. And, and, and I want to ask you about this because now I, I just call it an early version of Look because in going through the webcomic version of Look and then mm-hmm. the NBM book version, I noticed quite a number of striking differences that I think – are significant in terms of the reading, and, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the process and the things that you were thinking about in going from webcomic to, to printed book with look. Yeah, well, I tried to have the uh, the print book kind of be like the definitive edition of it, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, as I was making look... I uploaded the pages to the internet because I don't know. That's a cool thing to do nowadays. <laughs> put everything on the internet. Uh, I would make a page and then put it up and then make the next page and then put it up. So it was a very, um, write, draw, upload, write, draw, upload. And when it was time to put the book together, I kind of went back and looked at everything, uh, especially the evolution of the art from the start and the finish because it was like a three-year process to write and draw it. Just naturally, I got better at drawing the characters over time. So I did uh, indulge myself in going back and tweaking some of the characters, making them just look a little better to my eyes, uh, messing with the dialogue here and there. I even added a page. I think it's page five or six because I was unhappy with how younger me wrote the intro of the story. (laughs) (laughs) So I added – I snuck an extra page in there. Another thing I noticed in this – this is a major decision I think uh, on, on, on your part in going from webcomic to, to printed book. About two-thirds of the way into the story, there is a major flashback that lasts for several pages. And mm-hmm. um, in the original webcomic, because I went back and look at, looked at this, right, the, right. there is really no variation in terms of your paneling style between – the narrative present and the past in this flashback, uh, and neither is there any kind of indication in a narration box of any sort that we're right. about to go into the past. But in the book, when this happens, and I'm, this is around page, what, 96, when we get this flashback, that's where it begins, uh, you do include um, – a tag many years ago, but I think even mm-hmm. more significantly, you do something dramatically different and noticeably different with the panels in that you it, it they have almost a a 3D effect uh and they don't have the black borders the thicker black borders around the panel uh and right. so i thought immediately in reading the book yes even if i didn't see that many years ago i knew that there was some <laughs> kind of shift in the story um and then i went back and looked at this in the webcomic and that paneling distinction you know not to mention the many years ago tag were not there, wasn't there yeah. right um right. so did you realize when you know after doing the original webcomic that something like that was needed for readers uh i got feedback yeah from people it it would trip people up it's like wait i didn't realize we were in the past hold on a second Mm -hmm. and it took them out of it so uh i stubbornly changed it based on feedback (laughs) (laughs) i I think i i I don't know to me as the person who made it of course it makes sense to me i made it but uh, but just within those pages seeing the characters and, and what they're doing it it just seems obvious to me that it's in the past but other people trip got tripped up on it so i you know clarity is more important than my stubbornness mm. and that's one of the nice things about web comics though too is that you do get feedback um yeah. in a really immediate way yeah that's very true people will let you know <laughs> they don't like what's going on <laughs> <laughs> um i'm curious did you train as an artist uh, no, I'm um, self-taught. Just uh, downloaded a copy of Photoshop one day and fought with it until it did what I wanted it to do. Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> so is that how you primarily compose digitally? Yes. Yes, I do almost like 90% of everything is digitally. Hmm. Um, well, uh, Derek, I'm no, sorry. I, no, I was going to ask about you know getting back to the webcomic. Uh, I was um, – I guess a little surprised that you still retain the entire story of Look on your website 
uh, given the fact that the book is about to come out. Yeah, so, I was half expecting them to ask me to take it down, but they, they never did. did. Hmm. No. Because <laughs> there, you know, there are some publishers, and I know that um, First Second is one that uh, has requested that if if an artist takes their work that begin as a webcomic and then they publish that, then that mm-hmm. they should include maybe the first chapter. So you have a truncated narrative, then readers will go on to buy the book if they wanted to get that, the rest yeah, of I've it. seen that too, yeah. Uh, there's a popular webcomic. The book comes out and the webcomic isn't there anymore. Yeah. There's maybe a preview. Yeah. Yeah, well, I've seen the same thing. Yeah. So so um, h- how did you come upon NBM as a publisher? Oh, just my initial shotgun blast of pitching my comic to every publisher I could find. And one of them said yes. <laughs> well, how does that go? I mean, it, it's interesting because that's – it's not a question we often ask on the Comics Alternative, which mm-hmm. kind of surprises me that we don't. But you know, not only how you find a particular publisher, but what does one do? What does an artist do when they have a comic and they shop it around? I, I mean I, I know – about the process from, let's say, a non-comics perspective in publishing, but but not so much in terms mm-hmm. of comics. Oh, well, um, a lot of publishers don't even accept unsolicited submissions, so I couldn't tell you about those. You would either have to have like an agent or know somebody, right? But uh, for this one in particular, they have an open submissions page on their website. And they have a huge, long list of rules and guidelines of how to structure your your sort of pitch package. So I don't remember what their rules exactly were, but um, normally you need to have like your one line intro to the story, the, a synopsis, a story synopsis. Tell us a little bit about the world, you, you know, set, set stuff up for these people who are going to be reading it and then include either the full work or sometimes they only want a snippet of the work. And you pretty that up and make it look as nice and polished as you can. And you send it on its way and hope someone likes it. <laughs> well, you know, I, I kind of want to jump in and just talk a little bit about that world that you've created and look. Um, it was a world that I felt pretty comfortable in pretty quickly, um, which says something maybe about me. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm feeling right now, a little Empty. barren, a little, a little, a little bit. What is my purpose in life? Mm. Um, but that—that uh, that is the actual midlife crisis. I agree. Um, but could you talk a little bit about creating the story space? Some of the—I um, don't know how much you want to talk about the characters, but there mm. certainly is more than just the robot. And I'd love to hear a little bit about your thinking about that. Um. Well, at, w- at one point they do visit sort of a robot factory, and th- this is – oh, and even before that, you see remains of humans just in the background, and the story never really hits you over the head with this. It's just stuff for you to find. It's like, are those – is that an old swing set in, in the middle of the desert? What's that there for? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then later they go to a robotic factory, and – the conveyor belts and the machinery is all still moving, but everything that's being manufactured is just being dumped in a giant refuse pile. Like it's not being used. It's just going through the motions. And I, I, and again, that's not even like talked about. It's just happening there within the world. And I think that's, that helps a lot in your world building. Just leave things for people to find. You don't have to yeah. hit them over the head with it. Yeah, I noticed that. I really liked the the little um, sort of village ruin with the little playground outside of it. That was <laughs> that was sweet, you know. Well, thank you for saying so. <laughs> I thought I did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, what did you have to keep in mind in terms of creating? The variety of robots that we have in this world, um, uh, like what were uh, uh, how, how did you distinguish one kind of robot from the other? Um, well, they all kind of have a sort of unified look. Um, they all have like uh, on one wheel, they're all on one wheel and they all have one little eye and a very limited um like there is 
as unlike humans as practically possible. They don't really have arms and legs. And they don't have a lot of facial features besides the eye. There's no eyebrows. They don't look like humans. They're they're robots. Mm-hmm. And a lot of uh, – coming down to their design, a lot of their designs are sort of – um functional like if there's a garbage robot he looks like he a robot you look at him and he looks like he's a robot who picks up garbage mm-hmm. and then they're lumber bots <laughs> right yeah and they have like saws and chainsaws attached to their arms and then there's, yeah, i love those yeah and then <laughs> there's one robot that um we see him toward the end which surprised me a little bit because i thought that after uh, Artie and his friend Owen got rid of him that we may not see him again. And that is, is it, do you pronounce his name Bowl or Bully? Oh, Bowl, yeah. Bowl. Yeah, Bowl. Yeah, and, and he's someone who, and, and tell me if, I, if I'm off base here, but he, he works at some kind of, I guess, major facility that mm-hmm. Artie goes to every now and again in order to be checked out to make sure that everything's okay. And yeah. uh, so Artie goes to this facility to make sure that you know he he's working well but he he's bas- he's doing this off schedule and then bull reluctantly checks him out and then realizes something may be wrong i'm going to have to wipe your memory right yeah and we and he's understandably not into that <laughs> already <laughs> doesn't want to have that happen so yeah. he gets out of there. Yeah, but then when we see him at the end, and I don't want to give anything away here, um, but I think it's safe to say that that Bowl does go through some kind of character shift or character mm-hmm. development. Yeah, just just him by him pursuing Artie kind of also takes him off his uh, regular plan. And he just starts to see more of the world, and he changes a little bit himself, too. Yeah, there is an interesting interesting interconnectedness here. Um, Just one move on Artie's part seems to set into motion a lot of unanticipated consequences, which I thought was interesting. (laughs) Totally unintentionally. He's just trying to figure out what his purpose is, really. Mm -hmm. He's just, just on a journey. Yeah, and he touches on people along the way, or robots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, earlier I used the word existential to describe the theme here, but at the same time, there's something zen-like in that with not only Artie but Bowl, as you mentioned, um, they basically develop as characters when they do something different. In other words, when they get off the beaten path or when mm-hmm. they get off of their routine. Because both of them, especially Artie at the very beginning, is locked into a specific routine, and this is what Owen, his his vulture friend, asks him. Um, But it's only by breaking out of the routine and seeing the world in a very different way and forcing yourself to see it differently and to do things that you normally wouldn't do that Mm -hmm. you begin to learn who you are. Yeah, it comes down to sort of like if you're unhappy – as, like the way he was unhappy with his lot in life, then some sort of action needs to happen. It won't, you know, things won't change or get better, or you'll magically get happy one day <laughs> through inaction, <laughs> or through doing the same thing over and over, which over and over and over and over and over. And over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, what about some of the other characters in the book? Because this is a world that's also populated by animals. And, and I'm thinking in mm-hmm. particular, and not so much uh, about Owen, but Mr. Hugh. Right. Well, I mean, tell my, us about I, Mr. Hugh. <laughs> um, my idea for him was that he was sort of um, – I'll go ahead and say that he's a robot. It's never revealed in the story, but he is, and he he's sort of like Artie, where he's just observation. He was left behind to kind of blend in with these other animals and just you know get information about these animal habitats. And he becomes a sort of, over time over the eons, he becomes a sort of like central figure for this little clan of animals that all just bands together. And uh, for whatever reason, Artie kind of latches onto him as sort of a, uh, 
um, I don't know how to say it, like a wizened figure to go to for advice. Mm -hmm. And that's, but at the end of the day, he's just another robot who's been doing his job for just as long, if not longer. You know, it's, it's interesting because in thinking about this world that you've created, um, there are still a lot of references to the natural world to, um, you know, the, the, the text begins in a desert, but then it moves to other landscapes. Um, was that purposeful on your part? And uh, were you making, trying to make a direct contrast? Or I was kind of curious about that. Um, well, I, w- I wouldn't say I was making any uh, political statements or anything like that. <laughs> but, I mean, <laughs> but no, it just, um, from a story perspective, it just makes sense for him to leave his world and appear in a world that he had no idea how to even describe. Like he had never seen trees and they end up in a forest. It's like, what is, is that? What is that thing chases us? It's, I think it's, it's, it's called a bear. It's like, what the heck is a bear? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, just going through different locations and then they end up and yeah, they start in the desert, across the mountains, go into a, a forest and end up some different, <laughs> places later just yeah change of scenery now you you were telling us that this is a world where the humans have vacated but we do see one human or someone who appears to be human in look and this takes place in steam city and i I don't know if i should ask you to give it away whether this is actually a human or not (laughs) well that's the question isn't it Mm, yeah (laughs) <laughs> um well i don't know i have some ideas about who he is more than anything he was sort of a uh that's kind of the point of him he's just supposed to see him and wonder you know um it, yeah is he a human is he a, a robot or what was he previously human is he a cyborg hmm. what's his deal it looks like he's in charge <laughs> who is he <laughs> i'm not telling <laughs> well, darn it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I was going to say that. No, that leads me to, to I guess, a follow up question to that is that there are certain parts of this story that we have in look that are I, I, they're, they're not incomplete, but they're they're placed there almost teased as a potential for other kind of stories that you could generate from this world. Mm-hmm. And that leads me to believe that. You may have something in mind. And another thing that, that, that makes me say this is on your uh, website, darkmagicpress.com, uh, mm-hmm. there is another story based on this world looking back. There and, is. There yes. Is, yes. Um, which, which is interesting because you've also sp- spun out a couple of other shorter stories from your another comic of yours, Magic, Magical Universe. And I'm wondering if you plan to do more with the world of look. I have some ideas. Right now I'm kind of distracted by, you know, other ideas that are currently more fascinating to me. But especially like I'm kind of seeing I want to see how the book does. Like if there's if there's demand, like I will gladly come back and play with these characters some more and tell you a little bit more about this world and I I do have the ideas for that. This reminds me of the um, the webcomic that you have that's called Comics Are Hard. <laughs> <laughs> you have that great comic where you have one idea standing there saying, I have mm-hmm. a great shiny idea. Hello. <laughs> and, then, and then you're like, this turned out to be a lot more work than I thought was going to be. And <laughs> right. then there comes the other idea. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a new idea. Pay attention to me now. Yep, that's pretty much exactly how it goes. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> well, are you going to continue focusing a lot of your efforts on your web comics, uh, or are you going to pursue more, let's say, you know, conventional formats such as print, or just you know try to 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 juggle both at the same time? Yeah, I'll probably continue being a crazy person and trying to do everything all at once. <laughs> it seems to be going okay so far, but. <laughs> My yeah, my problem is I have too too many interests and too many things, and I want to do everything. But um, 
Yeah, like like you were saying, I have these like short stories that I've been putting up on my website, and that's kind of what I've been trying to focus on is telling telling more long long form stuff rather than the gag a day comic that I used to be doing. I think I feel like I'm strong that it's a stronger place for me to be telling stories. Uh, I'm not as hilarious as I thought I was with the gag a day comics. <laughs> And I noticed that you also have a Patreon account, and I, that's a way for uh, some creators, especially those who do web comics, uh, to continue doing what they do. Yeah, it's it's really nice, and it's really all the cool people who support me on there. They're they're, they're cool people, and then it's like meeting new friends, and they actually helping you achieve the things you're trying to achieve, and internet. Um, advertising money has been slowly declining over the years. I have like, you know, banners on my website, but they don't do anything anymore. So it's really great that this sort of uh, alternate revenue stream arrived. And it's so, it's a cool connection with the people who follow your work, your fans, Mm -hmm. you know, it's really good. Um, are you part of sort of the scene in Portland? I know there's a lot of comics creators to whom Derek mm-hmm. and I have read and talked to. Is it a good environment for the work that you're doing? It must be. It must be because I'm not really, I don't, I guess the scene, I'm not part of the scene. I just kind of <laughs> happen to live here. But there, there must be some sort of innate comic making energy like in the bricks or something that I picked up on and other people <laughs> are picking up on. Because there's a lot of comic artists here. It's crazy. <laughs> now, you're there in New York now, uh, right, right for yeah. the uh, MoCA uh, Festival this year. And this is where the book mm-hmm. will debut. Ha- have you been to MoCA before? I have not. I've never been on this side of the country before. Oh, so oh this is gosh. an entirely new experience for you. Yes. Though the rain is very familiar. <laughs> Are you completely whacked out to be in the Eastern time zone? Not yet. I'm sure it will hit me very soon. <laughs> I just I just got off the plane and into the hotel. It hasn't quite uh, hit me yet. I'm sure it's coming. Yeah. So so how does this work? Um, is, is this something that NBM uh, helped to organize, or did they encourage oh, yeah. you to go? Yeah. Do they have a table there? They do. And, I've never uh, been yes, to Mocha. They've... You can probably tell. <laughs> I haven't either. We'll learn about it together. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, they they flew me out, and they they have a table, and I'll be there with them. Well, you should have a great time. I haven't gotten to go, but I've I always follow because I have a really good friend in the New York comic scene who goes all the time and is always sending me pictures. And I I've really got to go sometime. It's just that um, for academics, this is about the worst time of year to try and travel anywhere. So, oh, yeah. yeah, so. So April is not is not always easy for for me, but I'm so excited for you, and I'm excited. This is the first time you're in New York City too. So, oh yeah, woohoo! <laughs> New experiences all over. <laughs> so you were saying that you know you're still going to try to juggle a number of things and uh, attempt to do it all. Is there a specific project that you're working on right now that you would care to share with us? Hmm. Let me see. Well, I meant we mentioned the short stories. Kind of the uh, idea goal in my head is to have a short story compilation as the next book. Okay. So that's kind of where I'm going with that. It's, especially because uh, Look took me it took me a three or four years to write and draw, and that's a pretty big commitment. And I told myself next time I'm going to do something smaller, and that's short stories. Because because comics they they are not your day job right? <laughs> no, they're not. I have a thirty. I don't work full time. I have thirty hours at the old day job. I work at a library. Mm-hmm. It looks away, which is pretty nice, if I say so myself. <laughs> yeah, libraries are great. They're a great place to to actually see stories unfold. I have a lot of good friends who are librarians, and uh, yeah, there's a lot that goes on at the library. So and I, yeah, and I read a lot of comics nowadays. I spend a lot of time in the graphic novel se- section, <laughs> getting inspiration. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> um, what else am I doing that I can talk about? I've done a lot of animations. Uh, I'm trying not to get too sucked into the animation world because I keep telling myself that's not what I want to do with my life because I know what what that kind of work entails and I want to focus on telling my own stories and comics. Right. But I have done a um, sort of a radio play adaptation of uh, Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Oh, wow. And it's about an hour long and I animated that. It was a paid gig, so I probably wouldn't have done it otherwise. Hmm. It was a huge undertaking. <laughs> and there's a link to this from your website, right, Dark is. Magic Press, that uh, our there listeners is. can can check out. Uh, and and I, and I see it, the, is the company Chain Chainsaw Suit uh, mm-hmm. original the the organization that commissioned you? Yes, they're sort of a mini. I don't want to say production company because I think it's only like two guys. But content creators, let's say that. <laughs> and they needed an animator. Well, what was, yeah, it, what was it like to, to adapt this classic uh, Washington Irving tale? It was a lot of fun, and they really just let me do whatever I wanted. And the, the radio play had already existed. They had already made it. It was a thing that I had already listened to and enjoyed. And I just... So it was already done. I just needed to draw the pictures to go along with it. Mm-hmm. But I had a lot of freedom in the visual aspect of it. So it was a lot of fun. So could you choose to make things very dark? Because you know there have been a number of comics and, and especially cartoon adaptations of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. And even when there is the emphasis on, I guess, the darker side of the story – um, at least in the past, my experience has been that the adapters lighten it up. Um, but you know, that is a really dark yeah. and extremely ambiguous story. It is. And there is a lot of darkness in it. And I would think, I would say that this adaptation tries to keep it, to keep it light. It's a very humorous adaptation. Mm-hmm. There's still a lot of the serious bits, like people do die in it and it, like it's pretty scary at all the times and i tried to match that with my art where it's very light and goofy but then uh oh it's serious town everything is dark and not good anymore serious town i love that <laughs> <laughs> Well, John, we want to thank you for taking the time, uh, especially your first time trip to to New York City, uh, and talking with us uh, on the Comics Alternative. And, you know, good luck at uh, the Mocha Fest. Uh, Thank you. (laughs) We'll see how it goes. (laughs) I'm excited, though. I'm very excited for it. Well, it was great talking to you, John. Oh, thank you for having me. This was fun. (laughs) It went quick. (laughs) Wow, Derek, that was a lot of fun learning about uh, John's background and his wonderful work in his first comic look. And there's a lot of great um, short stories and web comics that our listeners can access online um, after they uh, after they've listened to this interview. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and I know we said this during the interview, but let's tell our listeners once again, and this will be in the show notes, that his website is darkmagicpress.com. That's one word, Dark Magic Press. And you can find an earlier version of Look there as well as a variety of other webcomics. But we highly recommend that you get the book because as John revealed over the course of our conversation, uh, he made some significant changes to the print version of Look. So definitely check that out. And really, the cover is amazing. So, you know, you you don't want to miss out on having that that awesome cover in your collection. That's right. And if uh, you want to find other great books like John's, then definitely head over to the website of our sponsor, which is Discount Comic Book Service. If you go to DCBService.com right now, you're going to find great deals on a ton of comics. You can't beat their prices. 
And then after you do get your books there, get in touch with us and let us know what you thought about our interview with John Nielsen. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up the phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. You can also contact us by email at the number 2 guys at comicsalternative.com or you can get in touch with us individually. I'm Gwen at comicsalternative.com and Derek, how can people reach you? At Derek at comicsalternative.com You can also find us on Twitter where we announce new content to our podcast and updates to our blogs and there we are at at two guys with PhDs. That's right. But you can also find us elsewhere on social media, such as on Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn, on Spotify, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, which is comicsalternative.com. Well, until next time, Derek, it's been great talking to you and talking to John. That's right. Uh, We had a great conversation, and there are going to be more great interviews in the days to come. Until then, I'm Derek. And I'm Gwen. See you soon.